He is one of the most sadistic and brutal serial killers you've probably never heard of, whose crimes were so heinous, so gruesome and aggressive that he was dubbed the Beast of Manchester. He embarked on a reign of terror that left the north of England in a state of fear, and the extraordinary lengths he would go to in order to evade capture are the stuff of nightmares. Hello and welcome back to the little shop of crime, curators and purveyors of all things macabre and mysterious. My name is Steve and I offer both solved and unsolved cases weekly, so if you love true crime and you don't mind staring at this ugly mug, then subscribe. And here we are, case number three of, well, infinite. As long as people keep killing, I'm hopefully going to keep making these. And today's case is especially brutal. Um, it's one I knew I was going to cover pretty early on as soon as I decided to make these for two reasons. Firstly, as well as gaining the title of the Beast of Manchester, he's also known more recently as Britain's forgotten serial killer. And that's largely because the notoriety spotlight was stolen from him because his crimes overlap those of this guy, Peter Sutcliffe, a.k.a. the Yorkshire Ripper. And because of this, there's so many contrasting pieces of information and really very little out there about this case. So I've done my best to corroborate it all. So yeah, I just wanted to bring some attention back to this case, really. Not for him, obviously, but for the victims whose families definitely haven't forgotten. And the other reason I knew I'd cover it early on is because this case is actually local to me. And even though it happened long before I was born, it directly affected my community and even people that I know. This is the disturbing case of Trevor Hardy. <laughs> Today we are heading to Manchester in the northwest of England. Manchester, the home of graphene where the atom was first split and where the first inner city railway was lain. The heart of the industrial revolution, this once cotton driven powerhouse of industry is now a cultural metropolis steeped in musical legacy and sporting glory. And home to me. It was also home to one Trevor Hardy, who was born on a warm day on June the 11th of 1945. He was the second youngest of four siblings, and by all accounts, his childhood was pretty tough. Allegedly, he was repeatedly and violently abused by his alcoholic father, who his mother also feared, so she was ultimately unable to protect him from relentless physical and emotional abuse. This is Trevor with his mum back in 1971. Like butter wouldn't melt. According to psychologists, this exposure to violence as a child undoubtedly affected his moral compass when it came to normalising violence, particularly against vulnerable people. Basically, his life was your classic petri dish for raising a violent psychopath. Now, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't even begin to speculate on what made Trevor Hardy have such a prevalent violence about him. One thing I do know, though, is as a child, he suffered a pretty severe head injury, which actually caused a small fragment of his skull to break off and become lodged in his brain. And this, according to those close to him, was actually a turning point in the rapid decline of his behaviour, and something psychologists have said could be a contributing factor as well. And also, according to his family, as the second youngest child, he harboured a resentment towards his younger brother, Colin, and the attention he stole from his parents. Trevor Hardy would quickly develop a violent reputation. He was in and out of Borstal and was feared by all the local kids and adults. Even as a small child, Hardy was a menace. And I don't mean that in a, in a Beano-y way. Looking through newspaper archives, I found this clipping where a judge describes him as a problem boy and explains how, at just eight years old, he was convicted for larceny and housebreaking. Eight. Now, I actually have an eight-year-old boy, and he's very much still into cartoons and Lego. Trevor Hardy was already nicking stuff and burgling. And in 1953, at the age of 13, he was convicted for burglary with violence. And by the time he was just 15 years old, Trevor Hardy was charged with 21 separate offences. And despite his age, he was sent to actual, like, real grown-up prison. 
12 months in Manchester's strange ways. Even at 15, the judge deemed him a danger to the public and he became the youngest person ever to be sent to prison in the UK at that time. Once he left prison, Trevor started drinking and the violence got worse. He seemingly reveled in the fear that followed him around, um, particularly in the local pubs where, on one occasion, he actually stabbed a man in the leg following an altercation. And later, while he was drinking with a friend of his, Stanley O'Brien, they ended up arguing over whose turn it was to buy a round of drinks. Hardy left the pub in anger before returning with a pickaxe, which he then used to repeatedly and violently smash O'Brien's head in. He very nearly killed him over a round of drinks. In fact, the injuries were so severe, O'Brien was unable to work again, and he did actually die shortly afterwards, apparently succumbing to complications arising from those injuries. Hardy was, of course, arrested following that attack, and in 1972, aged 31, he was once again jailed, this time for five years for wounding with intent, and the judge actually labelled him a menace to society. Little did he know just how much of a menace he would go on to be. Prison did not mellow Hardy out, no. If anything, it gave him time to brood on revenge. And he shortlisted two people for death. The first was Stanley O'Brien, who he blamed for his imprisonment. Yes, Trevor Hardy wanted revenge on the man he attacked. The second was 14-year-old Beverly Driver. He had become completely infatuated with her, a child, and he was now in his 30s. Her parents had demanded that she sever ties with Hardy, and she did so by sending him a letter in prison. So he wanted her dead. He was released from the Isle of Wight's Albany Jail on the 18th of November 1974. He later admitted to police that on the train ride back to Manchester he just kept saying O'Brien and Beverly over and over like a chant, like some sort of mantra of hate. He was by all accounts devastated when he arrived back at his parents' house in Moston, Manchester, and they told him O'Brien had died while he was locked away. Not because he had effectively ended his friend's life, but because it spoiled his chance to kill him properly. Fast forward to New Year's Eve 1974, only a little over a month after his release and while Hardy was still on parole. He went over to Beverly Driver's home in Newton Heath only to find she was nowhere to be seen and so he angrily threw an axe through her window before rampaging around the streets, heavily intoxicated and armed with a knife searching for her. In his drunken state, Hardy apparently mistook 15-year-old Janet Leslie Stewart for Beverly. Janet was on her way to a party and Hardy, without warning, stabbed her twice in the throat. He then dragged her lifeless body to a nearby clay pit and buried her in a shallow grave. In the subsequent weeks, Hardy repeatedly returned to the makeshift grave to further cut up her body, scattering pieces of her around the city in a desperate attempt to cover his heinous crime. And he uh, tossed her head into a lake. Janet never arrived at the party, nor did she return home, and so she was reported as a missing person the following day. It would be almost two years before her family would discover her fate. Hardy took a ring from Janet's hand. He would go on to give this to a later love interest, Sheila Farrow, who will be making more appearances later. Just over six months later, on the 19th of July 1975, 17-year-old Wanda Scarla was walking down Lightbound Road from the Lightbound Hotel in Moston, where she worked as a barmaid. She was just 400 yards from her home when Hardy struck her over the head with a brick. He then stripped, strangled and sexually assaulted Wanda, and like most serial killers he decided to take some trophies to remember the occasion, and so he kept Wanda's bloodstained handbag, a shoe and her right nipple which he had bitten off. This is said to have been an homage to the MO of Neville Heath, a serial killer admired by Hardy. 
Afterwards, he repeatedly smashed her head with the brick until it was completely crushed to the point of no longer being recognisable, which may have been his goal. He then gouged out her eyes and somehow managed to embed them in her abdomen. He made little effort to hide her naked and mutilated body this time, and she was found partially buried on a building site the following day when someone spotted a pair of legs emerging from a pile of cardboard and bricks. And Hardy returned a few days later and placed Wanda's shoe back at the scene of the crime in an effort to taunt police. Clearly, this was a game to him. News of Wanda's murder spread fast around Manchester, and whilst drinking in a pub with his brother Colin, Trevor incessantly brought up the subject as if it were all he wanted to talk about. Now, according to Colin, he asked his brother why he was so obsessed with the murder, and Trevor replied, I did it. Now, Colin was understandably terrified. He wanted to leave immediately, but then he was terrified that his brother thought he was going to go and snitch. And even though he was his own brother, he was understandably afraid of him. So he just acted as casually as he possibly could in the circumstances. To his horror, though, Trevor insisted he walk Colin back to his home, which he did. And they both entered. He may have sensed something was amiss and that he perhaps shouldn't have confessed to murder. So he viciously and brutally beat his little brother in what is thought to be an attempt to scare him. Colin fell unconscious. His girlfriend had witnessed the whole thing. Trevor demanded that she make him beans on toast, which he calmly and slowly ate while his brother lay unconscious. And then he just left. The next day they reported the assault and the confession to the police. Trevor Hardy was arrested for Wanda Scala's murder and looking at his criminal record, he certainly fit the bill but he denied being Wanda's killer. Police took a saliva sample from Hardy, which they compared to a sample left on Wanda's breast where the nipple had been bitten off. It matched the blood group, but that was about it. This was the 1970s after all, and forensic science had a long way to go before DNA profiling would be used. But it got Hardy thinking. Clearly they were looking into the bite, and whilst in custody, he started to worry that they were going to use it as evidence to convict him. At some point, he had a small file smuggled into prison, which police say was likely during a visit from Sheila Farrow, his girlfriend and the woman he gave Janet's ring to. Now, it would have been agony, but Hardy knew that a dental impression and bite profile would likely be enough to charge him with murder. So he used the file to slowly grind his teeth down and reshape them. Makes your teeth hurt just thinking about that, doesn't it? Incredibly, it worked. Police did take an impression of his bite and compared it to Wanda's body, and there was no conclusive match. On top of this, Sheila Farrow actually gave him an alibi. She told police that he was at home with her on the night of the murder. And so ultimately, police had nothing to go on. After all, Colin could have been making it all up to get back at him for the beating. And the blood type evidence was circumstantial at best. So they couldn't charge him with murder. All they could get him with at that time was the assault on his brother. And he got a suspended sentence and walked free, and had seemingly got away with two murders. In December 1975, roughly a year after Janet's murder, Trevor Hardy made the front page of the local press, but not for the reason you might think. He was actually hailed a hero after his neighbour's house sat on fire, and he walked into the burning building to save their lives. Only what the police didn't know at that time was he actually started that fire. A few months later, on the 5th of March 1976, Hardy viciously attacked 21-year-old Christian Campbell in a pub toilet. He put his hand between her legs and she pushed him away, which had angered him. He started to strangle her and she actually ended up biting off part of her own tongue during the struggle. Luckily, he got disturbed and scarpered, so she survived the ordeal. The attack was reported, but wasn't connected to Trevor Hardy until later. His next victim was not as lucky. Just days later, 17-year-old Sharon Mossoff had been to an office party and she called her parents around midnight to let them know she was catching the bus and would be home soon. After getting off the 98 bus, she saw Hardy trying to break into her place of work, Marlborough Mill, with a screwdriver. She confronted him and he attacked her with the screwdriver. He then beat her, stripped her naked and strangled her to death with her own tights. He then chewed off one of her nipples before throwing her in the Rochdale Canal at this exact spot in Failsworth just 300 yards from her home. 
So he'd basically made the exact same mistake again and left another bite mark on her body, despite the fact that he'd only just got away with it by the skin of his teeth. He realised this, and so he climbed into the freezing canal water, and he used a metal rivet on his jacket to scratch the bite mark no fewer than 64 times in order to destroy the evidence. Sharon's stripped and mutilated body was discovered the following day by a local factory worker. It was so cold that by the time she was found, the water had completely frozen around her body. Ah, the 1970s. They were a different time in the north of England, where kids respected their elders and you could leave your doors unlocked. Oh yeah, except there were two serial killers on the loose. News of Sharon's murder exploded, and due to the very similar MO, you know, girls alone at night, violence, bitten nipples, it didn't take police long to connect the two murders, which left Manchester in a state of panic about the serial killer the media was now dubbing the Beast of Manchester. This police team were put in charge of the operation to apprehend him, and at the height of the search, 23,000 people were stopped and searched. And as he was already a prime suspect, Hardy decided to lie low and he effectively went on the run, living in quarries, railway tunnels and canal banks. During this time, they identified him as the man who attacked Christian Campbell, and so the manhunt was on, to track Trevor Hardy before he struck again. Police eventually received a tip-off regarding the location of Hardy's girlfriend, Sheila Farrow. They tracked her and surveilled her constantly, and in April 1976, she led them to a small apartment on Wellington Road in Stockport. They knocked on the door and Sheila Farrow invited them in, where they questioned her about Hardy's whereabouts. She told them she had no idea where he was, but as she said it, she silently pointed towards the ceiling. Police entered the attic and there they found Trevor Joseph Hardy in hiding. They asked him to climb down and he said, OK, quotes, as long as you don't hit me. Now, there's something ironic to me about that. There's a man who exhibited violence his entire life and attacked the vulnerable, and he's afraid of being hit. And with Hardy now in custody, Sheila Farrow felt comfortable to make a full confession, including admitting to providing him with an alibi for Wanda Scala's murder. And so Trevor Hardy was charged with the double murder. He denied it, and so the case would go to trial. However, in August of 1976, in Strangeways Prison, he made a full confession. Not only did he admit to killing Wanda and Sharon, he actually confessed to a third murder. Janet Leslie Stewart. Her case had by now been unsolved for almost two years. She had never been found. He led police to the lake where he had thrown her severed head before also leading them to a shallow grave in Newton Heath which contained some of her skeleton. Why he confessed to the third murder, nobody really knows but he knew he was going to be spending the rest of his life in prison by this point, so I can only imagine he wanted the notoriety. He was now officially a triple murderer and a prolific serial killer. But Trevor Hardy pleaded not guilty, and then five days into his trial, he sacked his defence barrister so that he could represent himself, like Ted Bundy. And so he attempted to confess to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. His confessions spanned 40 pages. However, psychologists did not deem him insane, and so he was ultimately held responsible. And so on the 2nd of May 1978, 32-year-old Trevor Hardy was found guilty of three counts of murder, and he received three life sentences plus five years for the attack on Campbell, and he was ordered to serve a minimum of 30 years before he would be eligible for parole. Sentencing, Mr Justice Caulfield told Hardy, This area is a happy place, but it will be a happier place without you. You have been convicted of the horrible murders of three young girls and you will go to prison for life. He began to serve his time in Wakefield Prison, West Yorkshire, and by all accounts Hardy was a model prisoner. He was even trusted with access to sharp implements. However, the judge said that would make no difference to his view that Hardy can never be released. He didn't accept responsibility and he even sent a letter to Mossoff's relatives blaming his own parents for the crimes. Hardy did attempt to appeal once he was eligible, but in June 2008, the High Court reaffirmed his whole life tariff, meaning he would join the ranks of fewer than 50 inmates at the time and spend his remaining days behind bars with no opportunity for parole. Trevor Hardy had actually also been connected with the death of yet another young girl in Manchester, 17-year-old Dorothy Layden, who was killed in 1971. Due to the similar nature of the murder, her family members requested that the Greater Manchester Police re-examine old evidence that might link him to her murder. 
Detectives reviewing the cold case looked at DNA found near the crime scene and it was not matched to Hardy. Some of her family members though refused to believe he didn't kill Dorothy and they argue that unmatched DNA found near the body doesn't really exonerate him. Nevertheless, Hardy denied being her murderer and since he had candidly confessed to the killing of Janet, this was enough for police to eliminate him as a suspect. And on the 23rd of September 2012, Hardy collapsed in his cell, having suffered a heart attack. He died in hospital two days later, aged 67. He'd spent 35 years behind bars, which at the time made him one of the UK's longest serving prisoners ever. Sharon Mossoff's father Ralph told the Manchester Evening News, Me and my family think that this is the best thing that has ever happened to us. It's like winning the lottery. We've had a big party to celebrate his death. We feel as though a burden has been lifted from our shoulders, knowing that he cannot come out and do anything to anyone else. We knew he was inside, but you cannot forget something like that. It preys on your mind. What he did was cold-blooded murder. He was an animal. Nineteen forty five was the year the Second World War ended, marking the end of suffering and horror the world over. But for a number of families in Manchester, the horror didn't end there. It was just being born. Trevor Hardy's horrific crimes terrorised the city and left three families utterly bereft. He is undoubtedly one of the most sadistic murderers the Western world has ever seen. But today the killer that one psychiatrist labelled a hopelessly evil, dangerous man is one of Britain's lesser known serial killers simply because his crimes were overlapped by another monster who left deeper scars. There are many, however, who will never forget, because they now live with the loss of three young girls who Hardy butchered without a moment's hesitation or a shred of remorse, before their lives had even properly begun. Thanks so much for watching, I really genuinely appreciate your time. And I know it was a pretty dark case, but if you enjoyed this video, please give it a quick like, because it really does help. And let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments below, I will read them all. So until next time, don't be a stranger.